بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على المؤوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد اليوم خمسة عشر من شهر رمضان المبارك الموافق ألف وأربعمائة واثنان وأربعون الموافق لسبعة وعشرين من شهر أبريل ألفين وواحد وعشرين نواصل درسنا في هذا الكتاب المبارك كتاب الله عز وجل and uh, we were dealing with Surah Al-Kahf trying to see how much we can uh, benefit uh, from this uh, uh, Surah uh, which uh, we believe we cannot uh, get everything but we will try our best to get uh, inshallah the vast majority of what we can extract from it so we are still dealing with the first story Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrated to us which is the, the most accurate narration you will never find something other than that very brief concise straightforward straight to the point and also at the same time uh, a lot of benefit you know and actually uh, success lies uh, in it without it a person will never uh, uh, succeed in his life so it shows uh, dedication you know for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, also uh, the, the the true application and observance of uh, istiqama in the way it should be done and how uh, uh, a Muslim should be favoring the akhirah over the dunya you know those uh, people they were uh, the children of the kings you know they are part of the royal family but they decided to take the life in a cave where there is no food no anything you know and they left and neglected everyone you know to protect their religion because they know living in that community is a big fitna for them why is it the biggest fitna for them because it might take their iman and they understand that the real loss you know in this life and the hereafter is to lose iman so that's why they prefer to neglect the dunya and divorce it completely and go uh, to a place where they can uh, protect their, their iman in it <coughs> So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةٌ رَابِعُهُمْ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in the way we granted them ability to run away, and then we caused them to sleep, we preserved them, preserved their body, you know, and then we brought them back, sent them to the city to get the food, and people know about them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَعْثَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ And then we let people see them, you know, we let people discover them. So, and uh, you have heard what was the decision by the people who discovered them. At the end of the day, they made a conclusion that they are going to uh, make masjid on that grave. So we talk about that last uh, class. So, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued to tell us the debate that was uh, going on amongst the people, you know, in that time who, uh, who know about them. سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةُ الرَّابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُهُ وَيَقُولُونَ خَمْسَةٌ so people started to wonder because you know according to that story which we got from the the Israeliat, you know we're not sure whether it is accurate or, or or not but this is the available this is the available and the prophet sallallahu said we can narrate stories from them but we don't say yes we don't say no but we can take lessons from it as long as it is not in contradictory you know it is not contradicting that which uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us so when they reach the cave we have heard that some uh, I, mean, I mean none of them managed to get inside the cave you know the brother who was with them told them I have to go and introduce you first so that my my brothers there they will know about you otherwise when they see you they will get scared uh, they, because they were afraid of uh, the people in that city so when they see other than myself they will be afraid of what might happen to them so he said it's better for me to go and talk to them and tell them about uh, you guys first and then you can come in afterwards so and then according to that story when he uh, get inside he never came out of it Khalas, finish so so now people are debating talking to themselves how many people exactly are in the cave you know some of them will say thalatha, you know, they are three. Rabi'uhum kalbuhum. And the fourth one is a dog. SubhanAllah. You can see that dog, dog, right? <laughs> His dog, you know. Sahib al-Salihin, faktasab al-Sharaf, you know. 
accompany the righteous people and then he get the honor also because of that. Say, Kulun Thalatha to Rabbiho, Kalbu, where Kulun Khamsatun, Wasadisuhum Kalbu. Another group will provide another opinion that says, no, they are not three, they are four actually. And we call it five. There are five, actually. Wa sadisum kalbum. Number six is is the dog. So altogether there are six. The first opinion says no, there were four, three human beings and one dog. The second opinion says no, there were five. You know, and one dog. That means six. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says Rajman bil Ghaybi. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala narrated. Uh, three opinions concerning the matter of the people of Kaf, whether they are four, including the dog, or they are six, including the dog, or they are uh, uh, the last opinion, last Muhammad I mentioned, which is uh, the one that says they are seven, and number eight is the dog. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrated the first two opinions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make them weak. Put them in a very weak form. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Rajman bil ghayb." Rajman bil ghayb means "qawlan bil adlib." Whoever is taking this opinion doesn't have any evidence to support this opinion. That's the reason why he says "Rajman bil ghayb." It means they don't have any evidence to support these two opinions. What does that mean? I wish you thought them away. They are not correct. You know, indirectly, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling us these two opinions are not correct. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that, he narrated the third opinion. He says, And some of them said, No, there are seven, and number eight is the dog. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, So this shows that this opinion is the correct opinion. Because he says, Some of them said three. Number four is the dog, or five, number six is the dog. And then he says, Rajman bil Ghaib, with no delete, people are talking there. Just mentioning words, you know. And then he said, And some will be saying, No, they are seven, and number eight is the dog. But he did not say, Rajman bil Ghaib. So these are the three opinions we have. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so the debate among the people, either in that time or in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Halul Kitab, they have these two debates, you know, either Sabatun or Arba uh, or or Sitta, you know. So Allah subhanahu wa taala indirectly told us that the authentic opinion is the one that says seven, and number eight is the is the dog. But then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Qurrabi alam bi idatihim ma yalamuhum illa qalil." You should tell them, actually, the only one who knows better about the number and the amount of the people who are there inside the cave is my Lord Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Subhanallah. Ibn Kathir has a very beautiful comment here. He says. Uh, he says, "Irshadan ila al-ahsan fi mithli hadal maqab." Raddal lil-ilmi ila Allahi azza wa jal. Allah subhanahu wa taala is directing us to the best approach concerning matters of this nature. To take back the knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa taala, not to go deep and talk here and there. You don't have any, you know, because even the seven one. If Allah did not mention it, it will also be Rajman bil Ghaib. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separated it from the Rajman bil Ghaib. That's why we said most likely is the authentic opinion. Otherwise, that one also will be, will be shaky. So matters of this nature, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you just to refer the knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and close the page. إِذْ لَحْتِجَاجَ إِلَى الْخَوْضِ فِي مِثْلِ هَذَا بِلَا عِلْمٍ لَكِنْ إِذَا أَطْلَعْنَا عَلَىٰ أَمْرٍ قُلْنَا بِهِ وَإِلَّا وَقَفْنَا but there is no point of getting deeper and deeper, you know, concerning this matter. And we don't have a strong knowledge concerning the exact amount of them. So that's why Allah SWT told the Prophet ﷺ, just tell them, Allah knows better. Allah knows best. And we don't need to go through them, you know.
So we talk based on that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted us. So if we don't have the knowledge, we do what? We remain silent. Allah says, قُلْ رَبِّي أَعْلَمُ بِعِدَّتِهِمْ مَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Only a little and a few amongst the, the people who know exactly how many people they are. Abdullah ibn Abbas used to say that أَنَا مِنَ الْقَلِيلِ الَّذِينَ الَّذِي إِسْتَثْنَى اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ كَانُوا سَبَعَ Abdullah ibn Abbas used to say that I am one of those few that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exempted. He said most of the people don't know the exact amount of the people in the calf. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِلَّا قَلِيلِ except a few. He said, أَنَا مِنَ الْقَلِيلِ I am one of those قَلِيلِ and, and then he said, they are, there were seven people. That's mean the last opinion narrated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us. There were seven people. So as I said, getting deeper, there are some, so many narrations. Some of uh, uh, the righteous predecessors also said, he knows, you know, you know so, uh, and there are seven, almost everyone is saying seven, seven, seven. So what is the point of uh, actually getting involved in this issue? How much you gain from uh, of Iman if you know how many, how many people are in the calf? It will not increase your righteousness, it will not do anything, you know. It's just a fact of the history. So getting involved in something which you have no knowledge of is wrong. Allah says, Well, I talk for my The best is to keep it aside. But since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicated that the number is seven. And Abdullah ibn Abbas said a seven a person can narrate and say that he yeah, has the best opinion is seven. But uh, having debate, talking uh, a lot about the matter, it doesn't bring any good, you know, to the person. You know, how, what does that contribute to your iman, you know? And that's how a student of knowledge should be acting, and a Muslim in general, actually. Whatever you want to participate in, just look at it carefully and make sure that there is a benefit in it, you know. Whatever you have no benefit, you know, stay away from, uh, from it because it is just going to take your time and you don't gain anything, you know. Your iman is not going to increase, but at the same time you waste your time. You could, if you put it in the recitation of the Quran or seek the knowledge or read anything from the sunnah of the Prophet it will be really better for you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيَقُولُونَ سَبْعَةٌ وَثَامِنُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ رَجْمًا بِالْغَيْبِ وَيَقُولُونَ سَبْعَةٌ وَثَامِنُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ قُرَّبْ بِعَالَمْ بِعِدَّتِهِمْ مَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is which is the reference to what I have just mentioned now that we should be focusing on that which benefit us, you know. Allah told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا Don't you ever debate concerning this matter with somebody. إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا Ibn Kathir says, إِلَّا مِرَاءً سَهْلًا هَيِّنًا خفيف. You know, don't go into it, don't get deeper into this debate. How many people are there? How many people, how many this, this and that? He said, don't, don't go deep. إِلَّا مِرَاءٌ ظَاهِرًا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't get involved with them. I mean, in, in a debate. وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِ بِهُمْ مِنْهُمْ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا And don't you ever consult anyone about the people of Kaf, especially uh, the, uh, the Ahlul Kitab, you know, or the Mushrikeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't you ever consult anyone about the people of Kaf. The greatest knowledge have been given to you. The most accurate one is given to you. Now just take that one. And don't engage in a debate with anybody and don't ask about them, you know, those children of Israel and the Jews and the Christians or anybody else because nobody can tell you the most accurate story other than Allah. And this is what Allah SWT has given you in the Quran, which is more than enough. He extract a lot of lessons and benefit from it. قَالَ وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا So, why you don't need to ask anyone? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says usually those statements that are coming, you know, they are rajman bil ghaib, qawlun bil al. People are just talking without having the concrete knowledge concerning them. And then Allah says, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدَىٰ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ 
واذكر ربك إذا نسيت وقل أسا أن يهدي ربي لأقرب من هذا رشدا إن شاء الله You know in this life the only one who controls the future is Allah Future is part of the ghaib That's why one of the most destructive you know thing that destroy the life of a person is to be afraid of the future it destroys you know and which is also uh, a kind of inter interference you know you are interfering Allah's you know job you know because he's the one who is planning for the future what should happen you should focus on the present the future you don't know ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it good and to protect you from any possible ev evil that can exist in the future which is against you in your iman Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the last part of surah to Luqman he says inna Allah indahu al musah and this ayah is the interpretation of an ayah found in surah to al an'am when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّهُ مَفَاتِهُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّهُ Subhanallah, Allah was describing himself, you know. If you want to see, you know, how great is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, read these two ayat. This, uh, this ayat, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّعَى uh, I'm sorry. وَإِنَّهُ مَفَاتِهُ الْغَيْبِ And the last ayat in Surah Al-Talaq. Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّعَى وَإِنَّهُ مَفَاتِهُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّهُ To Allah, the mafatih, the keys to the unseen belong. So that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is controlling the unseen. Future is part of it. La ya'lamuha illahu. Nobody knows the unseen except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about himself. I really enjoy reading this ayah whenever I read it, subhanAllah. He says, وَيَعْلَمْ مَا فِي الْبَرْدِ وَالْبَحْرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that which is in the sea and also on the land. What left? <laughs> Technically nothing, you know. He said, what is in the sea, Allah SWT knows it. And what is on the land, also Allah SWT knows it. وَيَعْلَمَا فِي الْبَرْدِ وَالْبَحْرِ And then Allah SWT says, وَمَا تَسْقُوتُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ Look at this, you know, accuracy and lutf in terms of knowledge and khibra. That's why Allah SWT called himself اللطيف الخبير. Latif, and he's so subtle and daqiq in his knowledge. When I say daqiq, I mean so no matter how much tiny it's something, you know, Allah SWT knows it exactly like the way he knows the biggest thing, you know. It's so accurate. Allah SWT says, وَيَعْلَمْ مَا فِي الْبَرْدِ وَالْبَحْرِ وَمَا تَسْقُوتُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا There will be no leaf of a tree that will fall down from the tree. Except that Allah SWT knows it. Why is it falling down? How is it going to fall? When is it going to fall? And where is it going to fall? And what will happen to that leaf until the day of judgment? All of these details are there. Allah says, "Ma farratna fil kitab min shay." We have never, we never neglected anything in that book, Lahul Mahfuz, the preserved tablet. We call it. He says, وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتٍ Listen to this, you know, if the, the first one, you know. First he says, يَعْلَمْ مَا فِي الْبَرْدِ وَالْبَحْرِ وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا Listen to the last one. He says, وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ You know, and there, there will be no seed that you put under the darkness of or the dungeons of, of the earth, you know. Some of our scholars was making a, a parable, an example for this, so that you will understand it correctly. You know. He said, imagine you go to the, to the ocean, okay? You go to the lowest part of the ocean. You reach the clay there, whatever is there, you reach there. And you dug it, you know, to the lowest part of it, if you can reach that place, you know? And you put a small seed, like an atom, you know? If that is a small seed or any, any, any. Uh, so you put that smallest seed under under the the earth, you know, the dungeons of the earth. You put it down down there, you know, and you cover it, you know, darkness on top of darkness. When you come to the to the surface of the clay and the earth under this ocean, and then you now you reach the water, you know, it's so so you know so far you know to the to the surface of the the ocean. 
They said the deeper you go, the darker the place is. So that means you are on top of darkness, on top of darkness. I want, I want you to understand why Allah subhanahu wa says, Fi dhulumatil ard. Inside the darkness of the, uh, of the earth. Darkness on top of darkness. Because this dhulumat is jamma. So if you were to put it in that place, the darkness of the earth itself and the darkness of the sea, one on top of the other, and let's say there are, there are strong waves, the dark, darkness of the wave, let's say there are bubbles, darkness of the bubbles, let's say you're doing it at night, the darkness of the night, let's say you're doing it at night and there is also a cloud, the darkness of the clouds, let's say you're doing it, in a, uh, I mean, on a rainy day, you know, the darkness of the rain. That seed that is under the sea, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just like something which is in front of him. SubhanAllah. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَا رَطْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ And there will be nothing that is wet or dry except that is 100% and precisely documented in this book of Lahul Mahfuz. In the last part of Surah 2, الطلاق الله سبحانه وتعالى سيس الله الذي خلق سبع سماوات ومن الأرض مثلهن يتنزل الأمر بينهن الله سبحانه وتعالى is the one who created the heavens and the earth ومن الأرض مثلهن and also he created from the earth you know uh, uh, I'm sorry سبع سماوات seventh heaven and he created also from the earth something similar to that in numbers not in nature but in numbers يتنزل الأمر بينهن the affair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wahi is being revealed between the heavens and the earth. Allah says, لِتَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ حَطَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا So that you guys will know and will be aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the capacity and the ability to do everything. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ حَطَ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عِلْمًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He, I mean, His knowledge encompasses everything. There is nothing which can go out of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As such, my dear brothers and sisters, if you are oppressed by somebody, or you are suffering from difficulty in life, or you are suffering from whatever, Wallahi, just reflect upon these ayat and remember that you are under the watch of somebody who never neglect anything. Go back to him. And the same goes to somebody who is so negligent, going against the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way he wants he has to re reflect upon this, to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watches and he is shadid al-iqab and aziz dhuntiqa. So that's how we should reflect, you know, whenever we hear these things. So back to the future, if you see the, the, this ayah, the ayah talks about the mafatih al ghaib the keys to the unseen. And uh, the interpretation of these keys, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, lies in the uh, meaning contained in that ayah in Surah Al-Luqman, the last ayah of Surah Al-Luqman. Inna Allah indahu al-masaha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to him belongs the knowledge of the Day of Judgment. Nobody knows it and nobody can tell you when exactly the, day, uh, the Judgment Day is going to take place. وَيُنَزِّلُ قَيْثِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one. So that's number one. Five things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, nobody knows it and nobody can know. You know. Number one is the knowledge about the Day of Judgment. Nobody can tell you. They have been making a joke, you know, even the recent one, 2012, I think, December, we're supposed to be dead long ago. <laughs> According to the Mayans calendar, calendars, uh, the, the whole world is supposed to be dead, you know. That was a joke, you know. Uh, we have heard all of these uh, stupidities, you know. Long ago when we were kids also, they told us that Day of Judgment will happen on Wednesday, you know. Even the, the Sharia says Friday, <laughs> their calculation says Wednesday. That Wednesday never come, and it would never come actually. So they still want to make a show. They brought another one also. They said 2012 will be the Day of Judgment. And what makes it a sad thing, you know, is that you see Muslims are even thinking, you know. Well, it's so sad to see Muslims are asking. Some Muslims are saying, is it correct? I mean, as a Muslim, I thought this is this this is this type of knowledge is A B C. You know, everyone knows that day of judgment only is is only known by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's only known uh, to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala alone. You know, these are things that you don't need to pay attention to them. Just move on. When you hear them, they, they will be the, like the 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 nukta the dahr, the joke of a year. You know. 
So they realize that they're going to make a mistake and they're wrong, you know, they have to be wrong when they realize that the world is going to laugh at them, they modify and change. Anyway, so this, the first thing is the Day of Judgment. Nobody knows when it will happen. No angels, no prophet. Nobody knows and nobody will know. And Allah is the one who is sending the rain. The clouds and rain they carry and they go and put it in the place where Allah SWT wants. Only Allah SWT knows. Imagine that person, you know, tell me which one among those people who are uh, having the knowledge of uh, as, as, uh, which, which one is the astrology, which one is the correct one, astrology or astronomy? Uh, not, those people who are astronomers, you know, they, 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 who can tell you, I mean, exactly what the Prophet Allah SWT mentioned about this person, you know? He was walking in, in the forest and then he heard some, somebody talking, you know. So he looked up because he can hear the voice coming from up, you know. So he saw clouds, you know. And somebody is talking to the clouds. Clouds, you go to the farm of so and so and so person and they mention him by name. Go to the farm of this person and send down rain for him alone. SubhanAllah. He was watching, he was so amazed. So he kept on following the clouds. And he saw the clouds went to the farm of that person and the farm was surrounded by other farms, you know. But the only farm that get the rain is the rain is the farm of that person, you know. How can I tell you this, you know, that rain will never cross this place, only this farm, you know. Most likely it wasn't that big, you know. Only that farm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fed, you know. So the man reached him. When he reached, uh, he reached the farm and then he found somebody inside. When he saw the, uh, the owner of the farm, I mean, he saw somebody inside, he assumed that this is the owner of the farm. So he called him by name. The owner of the farm was surprised. He said, I don't know you. How do you know my name? And then he narrated the story to him. And he told him, uh, he narrated the story to him that I, I heard. Uh, the, the clouds and somebody was talking to the clouds and they, they were commanded to come to your farm only you know and I was witnessing this and the rain never crossed your farm you know never went to any other farm except yours he said honestly speaking what exactly are you doing you know to to get this blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said I don't know but what I know is that if I during the harvest after the harvest I, 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 I remove everything and then I divide it by three. One of it I sell, I, 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 I give it in charity. The, the other third I keep it with my, I eat with the family. And the other third I put it back in the farm. And this is my life, you know, I just grow. I eat one third, one third I give it in charity and the other third I... And SubhanAllah, look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking care of him and his risk. You know, this miracle, you know, karama we call it, you know, took place. For him, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good and help us to maintain our iman and to remember that being with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only path to success. And don't worry, when you give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says, وَمَا أَنفَقْتُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُ Usually, it is part of what I'm talking about, the, the fear of the future. If I give now, I become poor, I become this, this, this and that, and then a person will end up not even willing to participate with anything. Wallahi, my dear brother, says, I don't know how to convince you, but what I found in this life, you know, I'm talking uh, based on personal experience, that giving never, you know, decrease your wealth. The more you give, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of you. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to Aisha, he said, Ya Aisha, I'm fiqi. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, ya, told him, he himself, Ya Muhammad, I'm fiq, yum faqalik. Allahu Akbar. He said, spend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will spend on you. Which one is more nobler, you know? Allah is spending on you, or you spending on somebody, you know? Or somebody is spending on you. Of course, we know that, yes, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is spending on you. So Allah said, وَمَا أَنفَقْتُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُهُ وَهُوَ خَيْرُ رَزِكِ Whatever you spend, whatsoever, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُهُ Fahuwa is referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Yukhlifuhu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace it for you. And then he said 
to give you tuma'nina to nafs, to give you comfort, so that you, wanna, you, you shouldn't worry in your life. You're spending, you can see the money physically decreasing, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, don't worry. He will replace it for you. And it's the best of the sustenance, somebody who sustain, you know, and uh, provide sustenance for, for, for others, you know. So if you hear this and you have Iman, you will relax, you know. You spend whatever you can spend, of course, moderately, because Islamically, it's wrong for you to open your hand and just let everything go out. Allah SWT said, don't do that. But He wants you to share that blessing that He granted you with others who are not fortunate in the way you are. So He says, Nowadays they can predict that we expect rain in the Muslim place. They will tell you, inshallah. I love to hear this forecast, you know, they will say, inshallah. Yeah, that's how it should be done. Because if Allah doesn't want, Wallahi, whatever estimates they give and calculation they give, it will fail. They can tell you, yes, definitely it's going to happen, but Allah SWT will cut it off. Because they're not the one who is making that decision. They're not the one who is planning. Allah SWT is the one who is planning. So that's why he says, وَيْنَ الزِّلْ غَيْثِ How much, when, how, all of these, Allah SWT is the one. And how much is going to benefit people, you know, and we're talking about غَيْثِ, the one that benefit, you know. And Allah SWT is the only one who knows that which is in the womb of the mothers. Yeah, we do have the ultrasounds and uh, machines and all of these things. And, yeah, but to tell you the most accurate information about the child, nobody knows except Allah SWT. And what we're doing now is not something so special because people of the past used to do it, you know. If you read a lot, you will find a place where Ibn Hajar was mentioning something about a sister who used to tell people what kind of baby they would get. And she wasn't a magician, she wasn't anything, you know. She would just come and sit with the sister and ask her certain questions. Based on that question, she would tell most likely the child will be boy or girl or this and that. And she, she only made a mistake twice according to what they have recorded. How many times the machines are making mistakes? A lot, a lot. They will tell a person is a male, but then he comes back and celebrate and buy clothes and all of these things, but then at the end of the day, it turns to be a female. Or they tell them a female and then it turns to be a male. So, the accuracy is there, but still the possibility of making errors is always there. Balash this, because even this one the, about the gender, uh, uh, the, uh, the gender of a person, even the angels who are taking care of a child in the, in the womb, they know this. You know, so it's not something special to, uh, for us, you know. Even the angels who are taking care of the fetus in the womb, they already know this, you know, because Allah told them about it. But we are talking about something beyond that. Is he going to be alive? Is he going to be dead? What kind of attitude is going to have this child when he comes out? Nobody knows. Is it going to be completed? Is it not going to be completed? These are all things which belong to Allah SWT. قَالَ وَيَعْلَمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْحَمُ وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ مَاذَا تَكْسِبُ Allah SWT says, nobody knows what he will be doing tomorrow. That's the future. Tomorrow is the future. You don't know. You make a plan, but there is somebody in control who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he doesn't want that plan to be executed, it will never happen. That's the reason why we do the plan. We, uh, we try our best to uh, make it so accurate and we work towards the achievement of that plan. But at the same time as a Muslim, you have to depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely to activate the cause and the effect. Otherwise, you'll be useless. Nothing will come. Your plan will never be executed if Allah SWT doesn't let it pass. But He wants you to plan. He doesn't want you to stay without planning. He wants you to plan and to put whatever you can do. The rest will be activated by Allah. As Allah says, Muslims, when they fight the, the enemies, they are not fighting with swords and weapons. But Allah wants them to make a preparation according to their capability. You know, up to date. It is incompatible. If you look at what the enemies have and you look at what the Muslims have, you know, they, they're, they're not compatible at all. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu it was also like that. But they always won the battles. Whenever it happens, they won. Why were they winning? 
because they have the real weapons with them, which is the tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and iman. So they do the preparation according to the, the, the command you know, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rest they leave it with Allah. So that's how we should take the future, my dear brothers and sisters. The future, you shouldn't worry so much about it. Make a plan to be a successful person in the future, but depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it excellent. And in the way be it in light, Allah, you will appreciate it. This has a lot to be said concerning this matter, especially living in time of what? Depression nowadays. So many things are going on in this life nowadays. So many things are going on. Are going on. In a way, people are depressed, you know, psychologically punished, you know. So the solution is to understand Tawheed correctly. The solution is to understand Qadr correctly. The solution is to understand how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is monitoring the system and who is in control. Allah, if you do understand it correctly, be ibn Allah ta'ala, peace will be granted to you. So this future, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Mada, mata diri nafsu mada taksi wa You're not in control. You don't know what exactly you'll be doing tomorrow. You plan, but you don't know whether you'll be able to execute it or not. You try your best to make it a reality, but you don't know whether it will happen or not. Allah says, wa ma tadri nafsun bi ayi ardin tamut. Nobody knows when, where exactly is you going to die. Many people left their positions to another place. They die in that place. They never thought death is going to meet them in that place. But they die. But this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for them. You know. So this ayah, subhanAllah, I wish there is a time, you know, to give it a try to talk about it because we really need to understand this ayah so much. We really need to understand. I do believe, my dear brothers and sisters, most of our psychological problem, you know, will be gone if we truly understand this ayah and we put it into practice and action properly. So trust is needed. So when it comes to the future, we leave it with who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why here Allah says, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدَى Don't you ever say about something that I'm going to do it tomorrow. You confirm that tomorrow I will be doing this. Allah says don't. Because you're not the one who controls tomorrow. It is controlled by Allah. And you don't have access to that knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you to say yes, it will happen. And that's why when you do things, istikhara is, is important. It's important, very important. And my advice to all of us, when doing istikhara, free your heart. Let your chest be free from any decision. Go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as somebody who is seeking for the best option. Go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the istikhara as somebody who, who is willing to accept whatever is chosen for you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To get an idea, why do you need the istikhara? It is very simple. The reason why you need the istikhara, it is simply because you don't know about the future. What is the vast majority of the thing that we do istikhara on? Marriage. Okay, you see a sister or you see a brother that you want to marry. What do you check? If you're a righteous person, you're good, you go for what? Religion and good manners. And somebody who has a mission in life, you're looking for success in the future. Then Sharia tells you it is better after all the consultations with human beings to conclude with this last consultation. You are asking Allah subhanahu wa to choose for you the best. To decide for you, you know. That should be the last thing you do. Why? Because all of those who are advising you, it's good for, for you to go and seek the advice. But all of them, none of them knows the future. They are just using the present appearance of that person and what they know about him to advise you wisely. But there is always something which they don't know. What is that thing? This is what exactly is going to happen in your relationship in the future. Who knows this? Allah alone. So that's why you go to him in istikhara, asking him to choose for you. And in istikhara, what, you are, what, what are you saying? He says, Anta ta'lam wa la a'lam. Wa anta allamul ghayyub. He said, Ya Allah, you know and I don't know. And you are the one who knows ghayyub. In istikhara, you are telling Allah, that means you are focusing on the fact that you don't know the future and Allah knows the future and as such you are 
asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose for you. That's why I said it's good for you to be willing to accept whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you satisfied with. Because in Issachar, after you finish, you just follow what you feel satisfied. <coughs> so it's good to learn these lessons, you know, from this, that since the future is not known to us, then we just leave it with Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make the choice for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لا تقولن لشيئن إني فعل ذلك قدا إلا أن يشاء الله. Don't you ever say that I'm going to do this tomorrow إلا أن يشاء الله. Except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes. He should say, Insha'Allah. Insha'Allah I will do this. Insha'Allah I will give you. Insha'Allah I will visit you. Insha'Allah I will come. Insha'Allah I will eat. Insha'Allah I will get this. Don't say and confirm that I am going to do it. Because you don't hold the future and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is in control. In Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated the story of Suleyman. قال سليمان ابن داود عليه السلام لا طوفن الليلة على سبعين امرأة وفي رواية تسعين امرأة وفي رواية مئة امرأة تلد كل امرأة منهن غلاما يقاتل في سبيل الله فقيل له وفي رواية قال له الملك الملك you know so the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said سليمان said one day I'm going to go around six seventy Wives. Okay. So how I many? He has seventy. You know, I was I was surprised that why the Christians are talking to uh, against the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, actually Islam. You know, in the Hadith, uh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned hundred or seventy or or ninety. You know, or hundred. Suleiman has. In them, in the book, they mentioned thousand or even three thousand. Some of them, you know. That was okay, that was okay. But when the Prophet also married nine, that was a big problem, you know. SubhanAllah. So he said, I'm going to go around at 70 or 100 wives. Going around doesn't mean just go around and talk to them, meaning he's going to have a relationship with them. What was the purpose? He says, so that each and every one of them will have a child, you know, that means 100 children, you know, he wants male that can go and fight for the sake of Allah and face the, the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants the army to come from him, his house also. So his, his purpose was that. You know, that is a big lesson here, you know. Many problems are taking place in, in our families, you know. One of the scholars said that one of the reasons why problems are taking place in our family it is because the family is away from the real objective and the purpose of a marriage. What is the real purpose of a marriage? To establish the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dhikrullah azza wa jalla. You know, they mentioned something very beautiful about Umar radiallahu anhu. He used to say that sometimes I have no interest in having a relationship with my wife. But then I will force myself, you know, to have interest, I will bring the interest. You know, it wasn't there, but I would just do anything to bring it. He said, until the time I will go and have relationship with my spouse, out of the hope that Allah SWT will grant me somebody who will come and remember him in my house. There is no way for the house to be broken into pieces if everyone in that house is remembering Allah SWT. It doesn't go like this. It doesn't go like this. Allah will grant them tranquility, you know. Imagine how beautiful it is. The mother is praying, the father is praying, the children are praying, everyone is praying in that house, you know. Imagine how beautiful it is. Everyone is educating himself, you know, everyone is studying in the house. How beautiful it is when you decided to do something that is wrong and your daughter or your son will tell you this is wrong, Islamically you shouldn't do it. SubhanAllah. The real personal advisor, you know, that Allah wants to grant it to you who is next to you. Who thinks about that which benefits you? So we must fix the purpose, you know. It doesn't matter what was your purpose to enjoy yourself, to relieve yourself, to do whatever. It doesn't matter. Now you have known that a last martyr has to get involved in, in your house. Get a last martyr involved and see what will happen to your house, you know. 
But at the same time, don't make it like you're giving Allah SWT a loan. Okay, I'm going to be righteous with Allah SWT. Yeah, Allah, I do this, you do this for me. No, you don't do business with Allah. But these are things, when you do them, these are for your own benefit in the hereafter. Do them because this is your job and the result is going to happen. So Sulaiman said, each and every one of them is going to have a child who will be fighting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, somebody told him, Aw malak. In some narration, Jalisuhul Malak. The angels who used to sit with them some, from time to time, he told him, Qul insha'Allah. He said, say insha'Allah. So he did not say. Because he think he already made his plan. So he forgot to say insha'Allah. فَطَعَفَ بِهِنَّ فَلَمْ تَلِدْ مِنْهُنَّ إِلَّا مْرَأَةٍ وَاحِدًا نِصْفَ إِنْسَانٍ قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَادِهِ لَوْ قَالَ إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهِ لَمْ يَحْنَذْ وَلَا كَانَ الدَّرَكَ لِحَاجَتِهِ الله أكبر He says the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Suleiman went and he go around them He did not say insha'Allah He go around the, 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 the wives and he had relationship with them None of them was I mean, none of them conceived except one. And she bore a child, not a child, half of a human being. In some narration, just a thigh, just a son, you know. So he realized his mistake and he repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced that. Because of the repentance, he replaced it with the kingdom. Nobody ever got it on earth. That's the power of repentance. You know, if a person does it, what comes after it is ease. You know, Allah SWT will expiate and remove your sins and also replace it with prosperity. All of those things mentioned by Nuh are some of the benefit of Tawbah. When you make it, you will definitely be rewarded by Allah SWT and life will become easier and easier. The Prophet said, he said, I swear by Allah, the one who is holding my soul. Had Suleiman said, Insha'Allah, he says, Lan yahnath. That swearing will never be broken. I mean, his word will be kept. All of those sisters, I mean, those wives, each and every one of them will be given birth to a child who will be fighting in the way he wanted. That's why he said, لَكَانَ دَرَكَ لِحَاجَتِهِ He will definitely accomplish his, his mission. وَلَقَاتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فُرْسَانَ الْأَجْمَعِينَ The Prophet said, definitely they are going to fight for the sake of Allah SWT like the best warriors you can ever see. You know? All of them. So, he did not say, inshallah, so he lost. The Prophet wasallam also, if you remember, he did not say, inshallah. He told the Kuffar Quraysh, come tomorrow to take the information or the, or the answer of what you're looking for. He said, come tomorrow. He did not say, inshallah. So that's why Allah SWT is blaming him here. He said, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَعِلٌ ذَلِكَ كَدَىٰ Don't you ever say to anything that I'm going to do this tomorrow. إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ You should say, inshallah. وَذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَسِيتِ And whenever you remember, uh, you forgot to say, inshallah, and then you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah I'm sorry, whenever you remember, you know, you forgot to say inshallah, but then you remember. Just remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment you remember that you, you forgot to say inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you should say inshallah at that moment according to interpretation of, of some scholars. Not just mutlaqul dhikr, you know, just uh, saying uh, any form of dhikr, but you should say inshallah at that moment. That's why some scholars even are of the opinion that if you are to say inshallah at that moment, it will still work. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's the opinion. Although the safest opinion is the one that says inshallah, inshallah should be connected to the statement, not the one that you do after one month or after one year, you only remember, then you say inshallah. But there are some scholars who still believe that even after one year, if you say inshallah, let's say today you say you will do something and then later on you remember that you do not say inshallah and then you say you say it, 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 it will work. There will be no kafara in your case. And although this is a, a, a weak opinion, but I'm just telling you there are some who said this. So the point is, don't you ever say that you will be doing something without saying inshallah in your life. Okay, it is very dangerous. You might be disappointed a lot. 
say inshallah. Whenever you decided to engage in doing something in the future, you should say insha inshallah. And what is the future? Future is a second after this moment that you're living in. Any second after this moment is called future. Starting from the next second after this moment that we are, we are talking. So, لا تقول أن لشيء إني فعل ذلك غدا إلا أن يشاء الله. And then Allah سبحانه وتعالى says, ولبث وقل عسى أن يهدي ربي لأقرب من هذا رشدا. And when somebody asks you for something, you know, that's very good for us and the student of knowledge. When somebody uh, uh, asks you for something uh, which she don't know, you shouldn't say, yeah, uh, you shouldn't say, okay, uh, you give an answer based on your ijtihad, you know. Or I will give you tomorrow, or I will give you after one hour, or after one year. No, you shouldn't do that. Refer the knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should say that, uh, uh, I mean, I, I hope, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, gui will guide me to the closest or to the best you know, statement concerning the answer to that question which somebody is asking you. And subhanAllah, this is... What, uh, what every student of knowledge should understand, you know, don't you ever give fatwa with that knowledge. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. It kills the mufti and it kills the mus mustafti. You know, the one who is asking a question might lose his life because of your fatwa. And the one who is asked, you also who is giving the fatwa, you might lose your life. Two stories which I will not talk about any one of them, but I will just refer you to them. You remember the one who killed 99 people? When he went to repent, you know, he asked somebody who doesn't have the knowledge and that person told him, you cannot repent. What happened? He killed that person. So now the Mufti lost his life because of the fatwa. And this is how it is, you know. He lost his life because of the fatwa. And you remember the companion of the Prophet ﷺ who was injured during one of the battles. And uh, he asked the companions who were with him. Because he had also a janaba at the same time, so he doesn't know how to deal with the ghusl. So when he asked them, what can I do now? Do I have any excuse? They said, no, you have to wash yourself. So he was afraid of putting water on that big injury on his head. But they told him there is no concession, you have to take shower. So he took shower out of obedience because he thought this is the correct fatwa. And what happens? He put water on his head, the pain increased, he lost his life. The Prophet Sallallahu said, قتلوه, قتلهم الله. They kill him. May Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala kill them. هَلَّا سَأَلُوا إِذْ جَهِلُوا إِنَّمَا شِفَاءُ الْعِيِّ السُّحَالِ He said, they killed him. May Allah kill them also. Why didn't they ask when they didn't know? Because the remedy and the medicine for ignorance is to ask. That's why the Salaf al-Salih used to say that if you say, I don't know, this is also a fatwa. It's better for you. One of them said, you should be very careful because when you're giving fatwa, you are trying to give somebody relief from his problems by putting yourself into the same problem or even worse. Because if you give him fatwa without knowledge, you're going to be in trouble with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Allah says, He mentioned sins, he mentioned oppressions, he mentioned shirk, and on top of all he says one of the greatest one is to say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that which you have no knowledge of. Allah says, Don't you ever follow and say that which you don't have knowledge of. He says, He says the hearing, the seeing, and the hearts, they're going to be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. So you'll be wondering, what is it going on in this life of ours nowadays? Everyone is mufti. In the past, people used to run away from fatwa. But nowadays, everyone is mufti. Why? Because we have a very simple Sheikh, Sheikh Google and Sheikh uh, YouTube, you know. You can just go there and get anything, you know. Good, bad, rubbish. As long as there is somebody who is saying it, it's okay. This is how we, we are, who we are nowadays. Fatwa shopping, they say, right? Looking for concession, you know. Uh, trying to make life easy in our own way. So that's very dangerous. Some of the scholars said, if you're going to follow the concession of the scholars, you will end up losing your religion. And by Allah, my dear brothers and sisters, we have seen people like this. They lost their religion. They lost their religion at the end of the day. You know? 
So, my dear brothers and sisters, let's be clear about this, that the most sensitive thing in your life is your religion. Don't play with your religion. Don't go and take your religion from anyhow, from anyone. No, be very careful. Home to consult, this is your religion, you know. This is your life, you know. It's the most sensitive things, you know. It's easy for you to lose your life, but losing the religion is too much for a human being to handle. And subhanAllah, we're very particular and very sensitive when it comes to our physical health, you know. We don't ask anyone. We go to the hospital and we are very selective. Sometimes if the doctor we're looking for is not around, we, we, we were patient, you know. We just cancel the, <laughs> the meeting with any doctor. We don't want the rest, you know. We just trust this one. And subhanAllah, when it comes to your religion, my religion, and then I just go and type a question on the, you, on the Google or YouTube and then I'm looking for answers like that. What is this, you know? What is this? Why, can do, why can't I do that when it comes to medication? You know, why do I need to go to the hospital? We should close all the hospitals then, you know. Just go to them and type your sickness and wait for the answer to come, you know. We don't trust that. You know, we should be more sensitive when it comes to our religion than this, you know. So let's be very careful, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, and observe this attitude, refer the knowledge to the scholars. Let them be responsible. There is nothing fancy in this. Wallahi, nothing fancy in fatwa, you know that? There is nothing fancy in fatwa. It's a big responsibility somebody's putting on his shoulder, which Allah will keep him, you know, uh, bring him on the day of judgment or question him about that. Ibn Qayyim wrote a book, you know, he called it Ilam al Muqqa'in, Arabil Alameen. This, this book, I like this book so much, you know. It's quite lengthy, around four or five volumes, you know. It depends on the uh, publishers. This book, the purpose of writing this book is to remind you about the responsibility on your shoulder. That's why in the introduction of this book, Ibn Qayyim says, definitely this is a heavy responsibility that whoever is going to assume this responsibility, he should make sure that he's ready for that. You know what does that mean? al muwakkain means those people who sign an agreement with Allah SWT that they are going to convey the message precisely in the way he wants. They will not uh, be deficient in conveying the knowledge. Imagine this agreement between you and Allah and he's going to call you back on the day of judgment. This thing that you told so and so and so, where do you get it? Just put yourself like this, you know. So this is a very big topic itself, but I think it's more than enough what we have heard. Just know your position. If you know something and take it from the scholars, you are sure about it, give fatwa. If you don't know, just keep quiet and tell people, I don't know. There is no deficiency in it. Just say, I don't know. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُلْ أَسَىٰ أَنْ يَهْدِنِ رَبِّي لِأَقْرَبَ مِنْ هَذَا رَشِدًا And things that you don't know, just tell them that, inshallah, I hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to guide me to the best you know, uh, a choice and the best decision and the best option concerning this, this matter. And don't give fatwa without knowledge and don't talk to those people who are giving fatwa without knowledge and don't waste your time in debating people without, without knowledge. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says, وَلَبِثُوا فِي كَهْفِمْ ثَلَثَ مِئَةٍ سِنِينَ وَزَّادُوا تِسَعَ قُلِ اللَّهُ أَعْلَمْ بِمَا لَبِثُوا uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he told us how much they they uh, they live. He said, They lived in the cave for three hundred and nine years. They lived in the cave for three hundred and nine years. They were protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were intact, never get destroyed. And then they woke up and then Allah SWT took their health back. So the people witnessed them. قُلِ اللَّهُ أَعْلَمْ بِمَا لَبِثُوا Tell them only Allah SWT knows how much exactly they stay in that place. So he said, ثَلَاثَ مِئَةٍ سِنِينَ So we know that yes, they live 309 uh, years. لَهُ غَيْبُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The غَيْب of the heavens and the earth belongs to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. أَبْزِرْ بِهِ وَأَسْمِعْ There is nobody who knows, you know, who hears, who sees more than Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. This is ego to Mubalaga. To tell you, you will never see somebody who has the seeing like Allah, like Allah's, and also somebody who has the hearing like Allah's at all. They don't have any any wali uh, to uh, to 
uh, apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nobody will protect them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he will not you know, include anyone in his, in his hukum. So, the creation belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the command also belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's the only one when he decreed and he decide, you know, he execute and nobody can have the power and the capacity to come and say, uh, we are here to check about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing, whether it is right or wrong. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَيْسَ لَهُ وَزِيرٌ وَلَا نَسِيرٌ and he doesn't have wazir. Wazir is a deputy, the vice, uh, 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 what do you call, the wazir, like the vice president, vice prime minister. Allah doesn't have a partner, doesn't have a supporter, doesn't have a helper at all. Wala nasir, Allah subhanahu doesn't have anyone to support him. Wala sharik, and he doesn't have partner. Wala mushir, and Allah doesn't have anyone that he is consulting before he does things. SubhanAllah, look at all of these secrets of accuracy. And then at the end of the day, somebody will go and neglect Allah SWT and hold upon somebody else. Hawadhu billah. Look at this one, you know. He creates everything. And he decides everything. And he decreed, you know, the command is uh, Allah's command. And nobody can come and, 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 and talk about his command, you know, and his hukum. And also, he doesn't have anyone that he's supporting him. He doesn't have anyone who is supporting him. And he doesn't have anyone who is uh, to replace him when he's absent. Because he'll never be absent, you know. And he cannot be absent. What else should he He doesn't have partner. And he doesn't need somebody to be consulted. He doesn't have an advisor, you know. SubhanAllah. He's so perfect and so excellent. And these are all message to you and I. That the only one he should be holding upon is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So I took from you at least 14 minutes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and compensate you. We said one hour. The problem is we started uh, late. So I stop here inshallah. This is exactly one hour, two minutes according to at the time we started. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant you good and success in life. In bi kulli jameel in kafil. Abdurrahman, if you have uh, questions, we can take uh, uh, ten minutes for them. I mean, the first question is by Brother Salim. Salam alaikum, Shaykh. Salam alaikum. What does the following saying mean? Iyakum wa talawun fi din, fi din Allahi wahid. Talawun means uh, having two faces. You know, and then you say it's in the deen Allah, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. And I thought he's talking about the iyakum at tanatta of the deen. Another hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa talk about the tanatta. A talawun means to have uh, so many times of doing. Sometimes you are this, sometimes you are that. So if it is not in the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribe and ask you to do, then this is wrong because the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. So this fits the time that we're living in, whereby we claim and we call upon acceptance of everything and anything. And that's wrong, you know. And uh, this concept of uh, wasatiya has been messed up, you know, and people are not practicing it and putting it in the proper shape, you know. Whereby we understand the wasatiya is to accept everything. You know, uh, somebody who does kufr is okay. Somebody who does shirk is okay. Somebody who does this is okay. We just wanted to be in the middle. Somebody was right when he says that if wasatiyah is supposed to be interpreted in this way, then Abu Talib should be in, in paradise. Because he is between the Prophet and the Mushrikeen. So what does wasatiyah mean? Wasatiyah means justice and to follow the correct path of the Prophet That's it. Because what Rasulullah was doing is wasat. It's the easiest way. The best way and the only way and the easiest way. So there are matters given to us by the Prophet ﷺ. He gave us options. You can do this, you can do that, you can do this or that, you know. Like the salawat on the Prophet ﷺ. We have around seven versions of salat on the Prophet ﷺ. Either one you take is okay. Like the adhan, we have different versions of adhan. Either one you take is okay. We call them khilaf tanawa. You know, like Ba'd al-Adhkar, you know. Uh, so when the Prophet ﷺ gave us different uh, version of it, so they are all the same. They are all the same. That's why Allah says, Ya Hadibi, he subul as-salam. 
and in another place he said let it be subula then follow that those small 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 path and ways they will uh, take you away from the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but in another place he says subula salam he called the he said that the 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 the, 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 the salam the peace has so many road that can lead to it so the scholar said he is uh, talking Allah is talking about the different ways you know variety types of things that Allah wanted granted us in this in this religion but to have two things which are contradictory, you know, uh, to uh, bring them all together, you know, Allah SWT never ask us to do that. May Allah SWT grant us good. I mean, uh, question was, can you tell me about the Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum If someone asks for your help in Ramadan and you are so tired of in this month. You are so tired of? You are so tied up in this month. Tied of the... Oh, tight. Ah, okay, tied up. I thought, I thought she said tied of him. <laughs> Is it not proper if we ask for delay to do it after another? Yeah, I can. Okay. Yeah, I can. The Prophet sallallahu his manhaj is that when he has, he give. If he doesn't has, he tells the person, come later when he expects himself to be getting the need of that person. He tells him, come later on. Mm. He need the, the uh, charger for not. Question by Brother Sayyid. Uh, no. no. The question by Brother Sayyid, Assalamu alaikum Shaykh. Wa alaikum as What is the correct method of praying Sikhar? Are there any specific paths or guidance from the Sunnah? Yeah. yeah, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, when you pray the istikhara, you should uh, pray two rak'at apart from the wajibat. Don't, don't do istikhara with the wajib prayers. You just pray the Sunnah prayers, two rak'at. And uh, uh, after you finish praying, you know, you read whatever you want to read, the surah and the uh, fatiha first, and then any surah, you know, any surah. And after you finish the prayer, you have two options when it comes to making the, the, the dua, when to make the dua. Uh, many scholars said the dua should be made uh, before the salam, right after you finish the shahud. Right after you finish the shahud, before you say assalamu alaikum, then you make that dua. Some scholars said no, it should be after the salam. Then you make dua. Those people who said you should make it before the salam, because they said the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said dubur salam wa dubur shayi akhiru, uh, the last part of the prayer and the last part of something is part of it. If you wait until you finish the prayer, then the prayer is over. Then it is not part of the the prayer itself. So inshallah, I think this is one of the the controversies. That both are okay. Inshallah ta'ala, if you do it after or you do it in, I pray for insight. But if a person uh, feel more comfortable, you know, he feels more comf comfortable to do it after the prayer is okay. And the dua is a dua you already know. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "You should say Allahumma inni astakhiruka bi ilmik wa astaqdiruka bi qudratik wa as'aluka min fadlik al azim fa inna ka taqdir wa la aqdir wa ta'lam wa la alam wa anta alam al guyub." And then you mention Allahumma in kunta ta'lamu and then you mention your need. Allahumma in kunta ta'lamu anna hadha al-amra you mention your need. You know, whether it is business or marriage or whatever you want to do. Khayru li fi dini wa ma'ashi wa aqibat amri faqdirhu li wa yassiruhu li thumma barik li fi. Wa in kunta ta'lamu anna hadha al-amra and then you mention the thing. You know, sharru li fi dini wa ma'ashi wa aqibat amri fasrifu anni wa asrifni anhu وَقْدِرْ لِيَا الْخَيْرَ حَيْثُ كَانَ ثُمَّ أَرْضِنِي بِهِ أَوْ رَضْنِي بِهِ Okay, so uh, this one you do it. And then you wait. You don't need to wait for a dream or anything. The Prophet ﷺ never said that. But Allah SWT, inshallah, will put inside you satisfaction. Whatever you feel satisfied and comfortable of doing, you just go ahead and do that thing. And inshallah, you will not regret be even Allah Ta'ala when you do that. Get an idea. So that's the istikhara. Can you do it more than once? Yes. The scholar said, as long as the doubt, you are still confused, not sure, you can continue repeating the istikhara. And it is always better for you to make it after all the consultations. You consult the human beings, you talk to anyone. After you finish with the human beings, then you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that will be the final. After, after that, then you don't go to others. Although it's not haram to go to others, but they said it is against the adab, you know.
And they say okay, it's against the adab after you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you're asking others. Get an idea? But it doesn't mean you shouldn't go. But they just prefer that when you are doing it, yeah, ask people first, finish, and then come back. And do the istikhara should be the final thing you, you, you do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us good. Does it have to be after Aisha? After? After Aisha. Ah, no. Ah, no, no, no. no. Yeah, the, the point is to do it at the time where Sunnah prayer is, is acceptable. Mm. Uh, question by Brother Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we are not allowed to keep dogs inside our houses. The people of the cave had it inside. <laughs> That's good. That's why if you go to some of the history, they said that was the dog. One of them was a shepherd. That was his dog. You know, uh, that was his dog. Uh, inshallah, I will talk about this uh, friend. Uh, uh, I mean, friendship, but looking for somebody to be in your company. Uh, the next class on Thursday, inshallah. So they said it's a dog they used to, uh, he is ta taking it for, uh, for his uh, sheep or hunting. So he has a justification for that. Even if, let's say, he doesn't have, which you say what? That was Sharia of those who came before us. We have our own Sharia, they have their own Sharia. In our Sharia, the Prophet Sallallahu said, keeping dog, if it is not for the purpose of hunting or protecting your farm, or uh, guarding your sheep, uh, controlling your sheep, you know, and your animals. The Prophet Allah said, it's haram for you to keep it. Otherwise, every day Allah SWT will deduct from your reward the amount of the herd. So, uh, people of Kahf, that was Sharia. A uh, long time, their Sharia. What might be permissible to them, it might not be permissible to us. In the time of uh, Adam, a brother can marry his sister, and that was fine, you know. If that story is even okay, they even the first person who lost his life well, lost his life because of this. So, but in our Sharia, this is one of the greatest things since you know it carries capital punishment. You can't do it. So Sharia could, could be different. You know what might be halal for them might not be halal for us. Get it? So that's how we should look at it. And uh, according to uh, some of the narrations of the Ahl Kitab, it actually the dog that they use for hunting or for the sheep. Mm. Okay. Uh, question by Stenor Sakina. Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Can anybody in Islam make us do the Shahada for them to convert? Or uh, and is it valid to do it? Can, can anybody? Can any Muslim make another person do the shahada for them to convert to Islam? Any, any Muslim. Any Muslim. If you have a tifl, tifl, you know, tifl, a child at the age of five years old, who knows Tawheed? He knows La ilaha illallah what it means, you know. He met a kafir and told him, accept Islam. And that kafir told him, how do I accept Islam? He said, say La ilaha illallah, which means you will never worship anything except Allah. And the, the kafir says, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. He's a Muslim instantly. That's why this mistake we are doing, that sometimes when you get somebody, you don't let him convert to Islam until you bring him to a sheikh. This is a big mistake. And you're losing, you know. <laughs> you're losing because the sheikh is the one who is giving him the shahada. Yeah, of course, you also have your own effort, but this is wrong. You should let him accept Islam first. And then take him out of respect to the sheikh. You know, he can say the shahada again also, and that's dhikr. The shahada, the first one, is the one that is recognized. He's already Muslim. If you want to announce Islam to everyone, he can say it in the presence of the sheikh in front, in front of everyone, which they don't need. You know, which they don't need. I witnessed uh, so, sheikh, one of the... One of the uh, uh, sheikh, is that, is that valid? Because of my, in the Philippines, uh, my friend is... Uh, she she embraced Islam, but the sister also in Islam is the one who do for her because we don't have imam in in our most of the time. Uh, even even if there is imam, uh, Nur Sakina, even if there is imam, it is valid. Every Muslim is a da'i. You don't need to take him to the imam. 
Whenever somebody comes to you, he wants to accept Islam, uh, immediately give him the shahada. Don't wait for the imam. It's wrong to wait for the imam. You just give him the shahada. Let him accept uh, Islam and then go and make it official later on. Mm. So it's valid. It's valid. Yeah. Thank you, Sister Thank you, Shane. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I was saying uh, that uh, Dai, one of the du'at, somebody wanted to accept Islam and uh, Sudais was there, you know. He says, no. <laughs> I, I, uh, they told him, oh, okay, we take him to Sudais. He said, no, we give him Islam now first. And then later we take him to Sudais, you know. I found it very interesting because if, let's say, on the way this person died and he did not take the Shahada, where does he go? Wallahu alam, you know. And we, we put him into trouble, you know. So give him the shahada immediately. And then if you want, take him to the shaykh later on. Yeah. Inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the truth. So I have more questions. Uh, I think that was the last question, inshallah. Okay. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, Jazakumullahu khairan. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept you and be with you wherever you are. Uh, see you on uh, Thursday, inshallah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.